Hello, my name is Stephen Sherrill. I am here with my friends Jerry Zoltan and Richard Slay on a rainy, rainy Friday night in downtown State College on the stage of the beautiful State Theater. And I'm going to read to you from my novel, The Lock Tender's House. The Lock Tender's House is a story about change and loss, about the struggle of confronting a problematic history, about Janice Witherspoon, whose life in North Carolina was upended suddenly. The bomb that blew a hole in Wednesday morning and in private danks as he walked barefoot, barefoot despite the recent disciplinary write-up, through the desert sand, back from the commissary with a tube of anti-itch cream and a bottle of hypoallergenic shampoo, the explosion not only wreaked its upward havoc upon him, but also surged through the earth's web of tectonic capillaries, pulsed from beneath the great bodies of water so uniformly that the schools of damselfish and chubs dithering at the various coasts turned en masse and simultaneously towards some primordial idea of safety. The ensuing waves lapping and licking at the remnants of a pier in Pamlico Sound off the North Carolina coast with just enough vigor to rouse the baker's dozen of plovers or gulls or pelicans clacking their beaks or squawking atop the creosoted pylons, the flap of wings and the shuddering that followed coinciding with a gust of salty wind that stirred the seagrass then rode the tops of the skinny pine trees inland across the Piedmont, traveling 6,347 miles away from the dead boy in the desert, where, as if coming home, the percussive essence of that bomb climbed two flights of stairs in the middle of a sprawling apartment complex on the outskirts of Greensboro, then, without pause, rattled Unit 33's door in its jam and shook the interior wall imperceptibly but with all the force necessary to jostle Private Dank's dusty, out-of-tune banjo hanging from its peg head by a thin leather strand on the wall above his Easy Boy recliner. The brittle strand broke. The banjo fell. The twang and clang upending the sleep of Private Dank's girlfriend, Janice, Janice Witherspoon, on the other side of the shared wall. Janice bolted from the bed and ran headlong into the worst, head, worst migraine of her life. The headache knocked her to the ground, instantly blurred her vision. She fell with the faintest cry and curled into a tight ball beside the bed. The pounding, pounding, pounding filled her head. There was no space for questioning the noise from the next room. Had she imagined it? Like buckets of thunder pouring over her, the pain drenched Janice's trembling body from her skull to the soles of her feet. Movement equaled pain, even slight movement. A ligament in the fingers going taut, pulling against bone and muscle, became a heavy rope squealing and biting against a wooden mooring post. The eyelid's soft closure rang out like a cell door slamming shut, steel against steel. She tried not to move. Was there someone in the apartment? Janice hurt too much to worry about possible intruders. Did something really fall in the next room? Or did the thump and discordant clanking so loud it even penetrated the earplugs she'd taken to wearing not long after moving in, did those sounds originate inside her own body? Janice wanted, wanted badly to reach up and pluck out the dense foam plugs from the ear canals. They had failed her that night. Whether or not the noise of the falling banjo had insinuated itself into her head, now the earplugs seem to stop tight the flow of blood surging through the locks and channels of her veins, pounding, pounding, pounding against eardrum, vitreous humor, cranium. She had had migraines before. She knew the pain would subside eventually, would ebb and flow. She just had to endure. Janice lay motionless on the floor beside the bed. Sometime later, hours maybe, she tried to look at the clock on the night table, but the blocky red numbers threw too much light. She couldn't stand, couldn't sit, or pull herself onto the bed. The phone beside the clock was within reach, but Janice had no one to call. Janice mustered her strength, 
reached up through the pain and grappled until she was able to drag a pillow and blanket down to the floor. She covered her head and lay as still as possible for the next two days. For the next two days, pain stormed around her mind, kicking open and kicking closed doors of semi-consciousness, doors of nightmare. Here, the bomb exploded again and again. There, the banjo pot struck the floor over and over, its strings grated against the bridge and the goatskin head. She lay chilled and sweating by turns. She smelled bread, biscuits. No, not just biscuits, burned biscuits. As a teenager, Janice had lost her sense of smell, and so, even through the pain of the migraine, she was grateful for this olfactory gift. The phone may or may not have rung several times, and if it had, would it have been anyone but her boss, and would he have made anything more than a cursory effort to find her? She couldn't stand, couldn't eat, couldn't make her way across the floor to the bathroom. Sometimes the sound took shape, becoming an umbral presence moving through the apartment and her sleep. Sometimes it became private danks plucking away on the old stringed instrument, furiously chasing but never quite catching rhythm or melody. Sometimes it was nothing more than stampeding hooves against wooden planks. Still other times the sound droned without source or form. Janice dreamt of walking, so much walking. She walked through strange landscapes, equally known and unknown and familiar. Had she been there before? She walked along a narrow channel cut through dark brown earth, the sides damp, cold, and muddy. She walked alone in and out of dream. It may or may not have rained in the dream or outside her apartment. The pen oaks lining the parking lot may or may not have iced over in the night, may or may not have shivered and shucked off their cloaks of ice in the morning sun. Janice didn't know. Janice knew in those moments of cognizance that Private Danks was in the wasn't in the next room. But she didn't know he was dead, that he had died the instant the bomb exploded and stayed dead. She didn't know that the bomb had stripped away his, ins his insignia, his uniform, along with his skin, that it blew out the cracked molar he had scheduled an appointment to have capped that very afternoon. In fact, she had never known about the bomb itself whether it was an improvised explosive device or a rocket-propelled grenade or if it was friendly fire or even if it had been intended for him in, the, in particular. She had never known whether his death was regarded as banal or heroic by those who witnessed it or by the others he left behind. She had never known about the brief and soft shower of blood that fell and its imperceptible hiss as it seeped into the Iraqi sand. Janice would never know any of these things because the National Guard was only obligated to contact next of, next of kin, and Janice didn't know Private Dank's next of kin. Janice lay on the floor and dreamed herself through the migraine. The pain began to diminish, each pulse less debilitating than the last. She was walking, walking along a dugout path, walking in half light or less. The world sepia toned. Somewhere in the distance, farther along the channel, a weak light bobbed and swayed, never getting closer, never farther. Janice walked, walking somehow just beneath the earth's surface, afraid to stop or to go back, afraid the walls might cave in upon her, upon her, mucking through the shadowy slough. But the walls of earth didn't fall, and after two long nights in the smother after two long nights the smothering pain began to lift, to rise like fog off the surface of Janus. She was able to open her eyes, to look at the clock on the night table. Almost seven AM. The early winter morning just barely prying up the dark lid of night. By seven fifteen she had pulled the earplugs from her ears allowing the potential for sound to rush in. She sat up against the bed, weak, nauseated, and so dehydrated she felt brittle. But at least the migraine had subsided. Janice didn't know what day of the week she had woken into, but even in her misery she considered trying to make it to work on time. Two hours in which to stand, bathe, and feed herself seemed barely doable. At 7.20, just as Janice struggled to her knees, her body weary to the marrow, the bomb from so far away and so long ago exploded one more time. The phone rang. Janice, 
Janice Witherspoon, as if she spoke through cotton batting, the words snagged in her mouth, leaked out, messy and damaged, what? The words coming and splintered and fell apart, what? And that was all. She didn't even know Private Danks had a brother, and by the time she had come to the terms, come to terms with the fact that the brother had already told her the boy was dead, that he and their parents were coming down from Virginia after the body arrived stateside, coming to clean out the apartment, and that they'd appreciate it if she was gone by then. What? Janice said, not why, but the line was empty. Okay, Janice said. She held the phone to her ear for a while anyway, hanging on to the emptiness, knowing intuitively the faint buzz in the line would be more soothing than the silence to follow. Led by forces that she doesn't understand, Janice Witherspoon finds herself at an abandoned lock house in the middle of Pennsylvania, where time folds in on itself, where past and present run together. She finds herself unable to leave. The body is here. Come up, mule. Hemp rope cinches against the snubbing post. The rope yowls as it tightens. Morning, hot, morning, already hot and not even 6 a.m. The baby's asleep in the cabin beneath the woman's feet. The woman, young enough but hardened by birthing and hard life, steers the slow boat into a rising sun. Whoa, mule. The man ties off. The mules shuffle against their harness. The boat low in the muddy water, full of coal or flour or corn. Ties the narrow vessel behind a dozen similar boats waiting to unload, all the mules hoofing the towpath. The man on the deck swats it flies big as nickels, pinches his straw hat at its peaks, lifts his hat and drags a lean forearm across his forehead, mourning like so many others, waiting to unload, turn the boat around, harness the fresh mules and go back upstream. The baby's asleep in the cabin. The hatch is closed. The woman scratches at a chigger bite, wonders how many biscuits are left over from supper. She walks the plank deck as quietly as her heavy brogan brogans can ma manifest quiet. Her babies are sleeping in the straw tick bunks at the stern. The second team of mules hoofs anxiously in the covered bow, the mule shed, knowing they'll soon be working. The woman sings softly, not babies really, two boys, two girls. Another year and the boys will be old enough to walk the towpath. Won't get to sleep so late. Not babies, really. The girls learning to make turtle soup, bean soup, morning, hot, tied up with all the other boats along the stone wall, waiting to unload at the dock. The man unhitching his mules takes time to scratch at their muzzles and ears, takes time to whisper to them. The woman goes quietly down the narrow stair stairs, so familiar with the boat's soft bobbing that balance comes naturally goes into the cabin for the night jars, which she empties overboard, all the boats bobbing gently in the wake, tied along the seawall, as they'd done countless times before, so many times they'd stop noticing the big cast iron pipe protruding, protruding from the stone wall, six inches in diameter. The man fetches the race plank, readies his mules to walk the narrow board into the dark berth. Steady, mule, steady now. The woman wanting to give her babies a few more minutes of precious sleep before she lights the stove and clanks the pots for breakfast, stands on the deck and rigs the awning against the coming heat of the day. Another year, and the oldest boy will have to sleep in the hay house, the amidships cabin. Stopped seeing the heavy pipe and certainly had no idea where it led to, neither its purpose nor origin, 6 a.m. 
6 a.m., the fat pipe practically tapping at the closed window hatch of the cabin where the baby slept. 6 a.m., and that day, the powerhouse up the river blows off the steam, blows the steam off its massive boiler. All that hot steam let loose through the discharge pipe. The discharge pipe aimed directly at the windows of the boat's cabin. The man hears it coming, hears the whistle, feels the rumbling in the ground, holds tight to his mules. The woman hears it, smooths her skirts, the steam. The sleeping babies hear nothing. The steam discharges d directly into the cabin, knocks the windows out of the other side. The heavy boat rocks against the force. The woman almost falls overboard. The boiling steam fills up the dark cabin instantly, scalding, scalding, strips the sleeping babies of their clothes, their white flesh going pink, then red, hissing and screaming, hissing and screaming. The mules at the other end of the boat, wild-eyed, stamp their hooves in protest. Hot. No music, but fever. Janice woke, her bones aching. Her thoughts mired in the syrup of a feverish mind, her skin tender to the touch, seemed about to pull apart from her bones and muscles. Her bowels seized and twisted, her stomach roiled. Janice felt as if she were floating on a raft. She reached out from the narrow bed and put her hand against the wall to steady herself, but the act took too much strength. What had she eaten? It was meat of some kind, several jars in the cupboard. She had opened one the previous night picked the irregular cubes of stringy flesh from their tinny vat of gristly brine with her fingers, ate without heating it. Could have been cow or deer or pig. Those were the options she gave herself. Not bad, whatever its source. The taste was off just a little, but it had been so long since she had had any meat. The fever going up and up. Janice moved in and out of consciousness. It was state law. All the boats had to stop when there was a body in the water. The woman, the mother of the dead babies, lies decimated, inco inconsolable in a hospital ward bed. The boats had to stop. You couldn't run over a body. Four plain wooden coffins in a row, too small, too small. Four graves side by side. Everybody had to help search. You take off your boots and your overalls. You jump in the water, feel around the bottom with your hands, with your feet. They asked the woman if she wanted to go to the funeral. They gave the woman laudanum, enough. When they find the man, the father of the dead babies, the husband of the distraught woman, they follow the letter of the law. Never take a body out of the water until the authorities arrive. The man had cleaned up as best he could, but when he attended the burial of his sweet children, there was still mule dung in the tread of his boots. Still the stink of coal and sweat about his person. You break the law, you pay a big fine. They found the man, the father, husband, not too far from where he jumped in. They dragged him up onto the sloping banks of the canal, left his feet bare now and so pale, dangling in the tepid water. That was okay by the law. The boatmen went back to work. Too much light, too much dark. Whenever Janice opened her eyes, raised her head, the house, the plot of land at the end of, Sa at the end of Sabbath Rest Road was too much. Her head spun, throbbed, filled with strange foreign images, emptied, filled again. She wanted water, couldn't fathom making the journey downstairs. She had vomited in the night or the day, her bile crusted across her chest and the bed. Janice reached, swept weakly, swept weakly beneath the bed for the chamber pot, knocked it over. Pretty, they all said. The woman, childless and newly widowed, was too pretty to go to waste. She can steer good as a man, cook up a fine pie. Everybody up and down the canal whispered about the tragedy. Everybody knew her plight. 185 miles of gossip and the man, the boatman, knew the face, and the men, the boatman, knew the face of opportunity no matter how sad the mask it wore. She still got some breeding years left in her. They bargained shyly with one another. They lied. They plotted. The dead man's boat went back to his company. His suffering wife had nowhere to go. A baker's dozen of ragged half-wits vying for possession of the woman she could steer a boat, cook well enough, sing too. But none of the bidders knew, her, knew or cared. What she liked, what she never liked, what she never grew accustomed to, what she feared were the mules, the whites of their eyes, their noisy lips and nostrils. 
the man who finally led the woman, frail, whipped, done in, but most of all compliant, down the race plank of his own boat, couldn't care less how she felt about mules. He hated walking the towpath. He hated switching mule teams. He hated stepping in mule shit. This was his boat. He was the captain. Until they raised up some children, she'd do what he told her to do. Got to fatten you up, he said, too damn skinny. Within a week, a dun-colored mare kicked the woman solid in the forehead as she tried to bridle the animal down in the mule shed. The man left her bleeding at night on a mercantile pier down at Dunbar's Landing. the Lock Tender's house is a ghost story. But whether the ghosts, whether Janice Witherspoon's ghosts are internal demons or manifestations of some outside force is up to the reader to decide. Shady Grove, my true love, Shady Grove I know. Shady Grove, my true love, I'm bound for Shady Grove. Beautiful the song, so peaceful. So unlike the night she had just endured, the week, the months. An unknown song, familiar nonetheless to Janice's ears, sweet, incantatory, incantatory. Peaches in the summertime, apples in the fall. If I can't get the girl I love, won't have none at all. Janice walked the towpath slowly, not out of fear, strangely enough. Rather, she walked so as not to disturb. Walked not thinking of the sonic connection to her dreams, both waking and sleeping, nor the madness found there. Walked slowly, deliberately, as if between the beats, as if pulled along by the drone notes, not out of fear. The fear washed away by the music, thaumaturgy. If I had a needle and thread fine as I could sew, I'd sew my gal to my coattails, and down the road I'd go. I wish I had a banjo string made of gold and twine, and every tune I'd pick on it is I wish that girl was mine. So she just sat off the path. There, the music maker with her back against the poplar trunk, facing Janice, facing Janice, eyes closed. Janice could not help but look, could not help but listen, could not help but close the, di close the distance between them. So pretty the song and simple and pretty the singer, her bare feet crossed like mislaid parentheses, marking time at the frayed hem of her red calico dress. I once had a muley cow, muley when she was born. Took a jaybird 40 years to fly from horn to horn. She smiled when she sang and why not? The words themselves silly and the voice that cradled the melody, rapturous. She strummed and noted the instrument in her lap. Her thin limbs conjuring magic out of the strings and sound box. Janice stepped closer, certain she'd be able to see the music take flight from the woman's mouth. Woman, barely. Pretty, dangerous, no, no danger. A lean face, oddly lopsided, lopsided. The long, thin scar angling across her forehead and disappearing into thick black hair at the temple in Widow's Peak. Higher up the cherry trees, the riper grow the cherries. The more you hug and kiss the girls, the more they want to marry. The face. Janice knew that face, but from where? Common sense told her she ought to be afraid. Given the nature of her encounters with other strangers over the past few months, why wouldn't this woman, this strange woman, strangely dressed, sitting and singing way out in the woods, why shouldn't she turn on Janice like the rest? She remembered a similar instrument at Paw Paw Landing. The music itself felt as old as salt and just as pure, necessary. 
Janice ought to be afraid. If the dead hummingbird that hung like a beautiful pendant on a piece of twine around the songmaker's neck, its eyes sewn tight, if that odd necklace were any indicator, Janice ought to turn and run before the song was over, before the singer, singer opened her eyes. Every night when I go home, my wife, I try to please her. The more I try, the worse she gets, damned if I don't leave her. Could turn in an instant this beautiful song, turn monstrous, become a discordant scree, a searing tumble of consonants and vowels that crushed and scorched everything in its path, or worse even, could stop altogether, could disappear, leaving nothing. Janice feared the vacuum. She hung in the balance between want and need. The song touched her, and the song traced to its source. The song maker, too, held sway over any fears welling up inside. Janice wanted to reach out, to touch this manifestation of beauty, to make sure it, the body, the face, the voice were all real, real flesh, real blood, real breath in that melodic throat. The eyes of the hummingbird were stitched shut. The eyes of the song maker opened. She smiled at Janice, winked, kept singing. Fly around my bright eyed girl, fly around my daisy. Fly around my brown eyed girl, nearly drive me crazy. No torrent of fire, no rattling bones, no cataract eyes spinning madly in their sockets. No spook tongue come noose to yank tight at Janice's gullible neck. The singer simply opened her eyes looked at Janice and smiled. She was real. She had to be real. She sang the song and the smile, warm and welcoming, forgiving even. Shady Grove, my true love, Shady Grove, I know. Shady Grove, my true love, I'm bound for Shady Grove. You like my hog fiddle, she asked, and in speaking broke open the spell that had lured Janice down the towpath. The voice, the speaking voice, though sweetly intoned, languorous and curdled. Janice didn't respond, didn't know how. She smiled back, but little beetles of fear darted through her mind. Some folks call it a scatlin', the woman said, or a dulcimer, or the devil's box. I prefer a hog fiddle. She lifted the instrument with both hands, as if it were a baby presented for baptism, offered to Janice. You want to pluck it? The dangling hummingbird swayed ever so slightly between her breasts. Janice had no answer. She took a step back, wanting to run and wanting to stay equally. No, she shook her head softly, no. And just as she was about to turn and walk away, walk away, the woman spoke again. Come by here tomorrow and I'll play you another song.
There's a sound like water spilling around the uneven seals of the lock gates where swollen lumber meets stone. Janice hears the water spilling through the chinks, sloshing over the shut lock, the dusty canal bed growing damp and muddy, like water rising. Janice atop the unconscious man and the water coming up, his shield, his protector, his anchor, for better or worse, his anchor. The water creeping up through his gray hair, the water spilling over the lock gate, surging around them both, the current swelling, gaining force, rattling the lock against its miters, the splintering gate and the subsequent torrent, the canal bed comes to life, and Janice on her belly, on his belly. She shares his breath, the minnows nip at their eyelashes, the turtles scratch away her back, and Janice, through the muddy water, rising over their heads, sees it all. The fluid lens magnifies, clarifies, all the bodies coming down the river. The bloated pig floats by with a possum in the ladder of its ribs, a mouthful of raw liver, and the man, his crude taxidermy, giving way. The man split at his rotting seams and the filthy ticking and dank clay falling out with each step trailing behind and the one-eyed cat on a spinning road sign and the babies, their hairless heads knocking at the bottom of the canal boats, their fine toes digging into the silty bed and the man with his stick, he beats her. He beats her. He rakes his stick through the woman's furrow, the splinters and the pale woman made more captive by her desire for the soft fingers, the warm brown mouth of her sometimes visitor, but the man and his sharp stick always coming before, the splintering, the flowing water and blood and mucus drops the still warm bodies into the outhouse pit, laughs like water like water sputtering over rocks, like laughter, like crows calling on a fence line, like singing until he comes in. Don't sass me, he says. Open your mouth and the hot pliers, the taste of rust, charred flesh and chipped teeth and the little nugget of tongue. Her song becomes a minnow flopping in the grass, the loss now unutterable, the rage without syllables, the tongue wriggling there until the crow wings into view, pecks at the grisly strip of flesh, the tongue takes it in the eager beak and flies away, the crow and the tongue. The crow returns, whispers her name in rotten and perfect English, Janice. Janice, who is naked and drowning and protecting this man in the only way she knows how. Janice, this mutual drowning. Janice, the crow says, Janice, the canal swelling with water and the blood of this man beneath her. Janice, the crow speaking in its undertaker's coat, its four-toed boots and clicking heels, its distant whis whisper. Janice, crow mouth, human tongue, speaking softly to her. Janice puts her fingers in her ears. Janice, she will not hear it, this crow, this seducer. She will not. She will not. Janice's story goes a little bit further. Um, the ghosts of her past and the collective past uh, are a heavy load to bear. But I'm not going to tell you any more tonight. Thank you very much.
If no one else 